speaking uh, as a panel on the subject of augmented reality. Uh, now, I'm really pleased to be moderating it because I know much less than any of these people about augmented reality. Uh, so I get to ask the questions and occasionally chip in insights when I do know something. Uh, so I'm going to look much more intelligent than I actually am today. Uh, am I just about loud enough now if I, if I lean forward like this? Is that, is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I'd probably uh, like to start by getting the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, and maybe guys, if you can keep it brief, if we could go for sort of like a 25 second introduction rather than the three minute introduction, that would be really good. Okay, yeah. David. Uh, hi everybody, my name is David Orban, I'm Chief Evangelist at Wide Tag, our open spine, open source software layer enables the aggregation of smart uh, uh, sensor networks uh, to the web and, of course, in uh, 3D worlds for visualization and a better understanding of our world. That was perfect. Very, very good duration. Thank you. <laughs> Come in a second. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just right. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Eric Rice. I'm a Silicon Valley based new media producer, uh, virtual world, a veteran for about four or five years, lots of new media, and moving into the world of game development and open source fiction. I was born in Evanston, Illinois at a very young age. <laughs> I'm Mark Goodman. I'm from Alcatel Lucent, where I uh, focus on innovation two to five years out. Uh, I focus on social media, social networking. Uh, I've launched the virtual world island for Alcatel Lucent. And I also run uh, the University Innovations Program, where I work with different universities across the country to develop the next generation G Wiz kind of stuff. Uh, in this case, uh, augmented reality, crowd casting, and uh, MMOGs are some of the programs that I've uh, launched. I'm Blair McIntyre. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech in the School of Interactive Computing. I've been doing augmented reality research for about 17 years. Um, so I've been doing it for a while. It's really gratifying to see AR finally capturing the public attention and uh, uh, hopefully getting out there. And I think it's the mobile phones in particular, and the next generation of mobile phones that are really going to make that happen. And so I'm these days working on uh, augmented reality games, especially on handhelds, and uh, the intersection of augmented reality uh, with mobile devices and sort of terascale, large-scale virtual worlds and how they can uh, interact, interoperate. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. And I suppose I should say, uh, I'm your moderator today. I'm Rube Reynolds, and uh, I look after social media at BBC Vision in the UK. Let's begin by asking the audience assembled here, how many of you have used an augmented reality application or, or service, or whatever you want to call it, at some point? That's probably about, uh, maybe maybe five to seven in the audience. Uh, how many of you have heard of augmented reality? Excellent, nearly everyone. Uh, those of you who haven't heard of it, welcome uh, to the augmented reality panel. Presumably you're here to learn about it. Um, I want to actually begin by uh, bringing up the Wikipedia page, which is always a good place to start. I tend to find for something I don't really know or understand. Um, and I've highlighted some key phrases and keywords that maybe um, if the panel would like to tell us what they think augmented reality is. Any of you who want to jump in? Um, and yesterday uh, was a great uh, sentence, and it was actually quite astounding to hear so many of the panels talking about augmented reality. But yesterday somebody said, why are we talking about augmented reality? Do you people have a mobile phone? That is your interface for the augmented reality. We don't need goggles, uh, and uh, that is that is uh, where I come from. Uh, augmented reality for me is understanding the world better through whichever means. Um, and I will speak about okay. it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. But Blair wants to jump in. Well, well that, uh, okay. like if it's presumably very technical answer about it. Yeah, uh, I, I, we, we have about 45 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I mean, in reality really is, is uh, as they defined on this Wikipedia page, instances where you're tightly registering media with the world. So 3D graphics in the world, audio in the world. I think there's a broader collection of things which probably reflects the interest of a lot of us. Uh, more collectively, which I would call mixed reality. So anything where you're sort of taking the physical world, whether it's just a location or a piece of sensor data or uh, video that's relevant to where you are. Um, I don't think it's necessarily important to make uh, strong distinctions, uh, except insofar as it lets us talk uh, in, a, in a useful way. But So I think AR in general, where you're really registering graphics, where I can look through my phone and see virtual stuff out there, uh, is, is what I tend to think of as I'm going to be able. Okay, all right, what is it to you? Actually, um, the best quote I ever heard about it uh, was 
I guess we said it, but basically it was the issue that there's all this data around us, you just can't see it. Yeah. Um, you know, think of how many photos there are on Flickr tagged for the LA Convention Center or Staples Center. It's mountains and mountains of it. The problem is we have to use computers and devices, which is not a bad thing. It's a great way to be able to hold up the phone and see something translated through the camera, but look at all the data that's around us that we're not able to interact with, whether it's Google Map data. I've already used Google Maps to find a place to get coffee. Uh, I need to use a device. If I'm driving, I need to look at a device. I just don't have any indicator. And I'm kind of spoiled by augmented virtuality, all the things that we do in games with whether you're racing or whether you're shooting, you, you always have this awareness of what's going on. I got kind of lost walking, yes, across the street. Because this convention center complex is so huge, I just needed the beacon, because I went all the way to the other side of the convention center. I just needed that beacon like they have in SL, just to say, oh, there it is, there. I'm just gonna go there. I just needed an overlay for all this invisible data. And that's essentially what, what my take is on Mark, do you have any things you want to add to that? Uh, not really, just you know, the very simple, simple bring it down to the earth is you're watching a football game, there's a yellow line on the, t uh, on the TV screen that shows the first down. That yellow line is not really there. Okay? <laughs> and when the people walk over it, their shoes don't turn yellow. We're putting a graphic on top of a visual. We've been doing it for a number of years, and that's a very simple area. Now we're looking uh, with the new capabilities of how we can improve that. That's right, thank you. And, and for those of you who haven't ever seen an AR application running, I just thought I'd quickly show you a video of, of one. This is uh, using a smartphone. And as you can see, there was a little tag there on the table, and, and now as this phone moves around, uh, the, the registration of this 3D object onto the table, this, this virtual object being overlaid onto a, a real table, um, it, it feels very natural to you, because as you move the camera, you're looking at it from a different angle. And all of that is obviously being handled by the, uh, by the software that pieces these two worlds together. Um, so yeah, for those who haven't seen one, that's what one looks like. Um, and here's a slightly more complex example. And uh, I don't know if anyone wants. This is titled the uh, the AR tag Magic Lens. Um, and if anyone wants to sort of jump on the, the theme of, of Magic Lens versus Magic Mirror, if, if Blair maybe you want to sort of touch on some of these ter this bits of terminology that often get banded around. Um, it's actually the Magic Lens term uh, was not originally an AR term. It was coined at Park um, uh, back in the '90s, like everything was. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but it was this idea that you have a phone or you have goggles, you look through it, and you, uh, like you suggested, you see some of that information that's around us all the time. Um, people also use the term magic mirror sometimes when they're trying to do augmented reality without a mobile device. So there's been a lot of AR demos. A lot of the, um, has anybody played Eye of Judgment on the uh, PS3 or seen the, the videos? Um, there's a new uh, video they just posted. Some company just posted called I iPad, which is a game that's going to be coming out uh, at the end of 2009. It's the same idea where I have my screen, I have the camera, and then I can do AR in a sense in front of it. Uh, this probably started back at the Media Lab with a, uh, a system called Live, where they had this dog running around in the room, and you could see yourself reflected uh, in this TV. Okay, thank you. Now, um, Blair and Mark have worked together in the past, and one of the things that uh, I first got really interested in, uh, sort of in the subject of virtual reality, uh, sort of augmented reality was the idea of augmented virtual reality, bringing not just the real world and, and virtual stuff together, uh, but virtual stuff uh, into uh, a virtual world and, and real stuff into a virtual world and a virtual world into the real world in a slightly different way. So what you're seeing here, you've got a lot of static models. Some of them might be animated. Some of them might be um, uh, yeah, here. Indeed, these tanks are actually moving around inside that map. Um, but you know, what if that was being controlled from inside a virtual world? So I came across some, some research work. Uh, I'll quickly show you a video of that as well. Um, where is it? Oh, it's actually on this one. I actually came across uh, came across this a while ago, which um, you may have seen. Anyone come across this video? A few people. Okay. Well, it's actually uh, somebody's coffee table, uh, and maybe Mark you can uh, maybe Mark or Blair can sort of talk us through what we're seeing here. Um, so this is actually, uh, the, we have an augmented reality client for Second Life, which is where a lot of this stuff, um, uh, this interest came from. Um, so the student who built it actually has an area in Second Life. If you go to my, the augmented reality island in Second Life, you'll actually see the set for that. Uh, if you look around, you'll find that, see that little car on that little road. And uh, so that was just uh, using the same marker technology as the previous two videos he showed, uh, that part of Second Life sitting on his coffee table. 
Um, this is a similar kind of uh, experience he did again in Second Life, and if you sort of keep that that set in mind, you'll see it if you go to our island. Um, looking through from the, the, my lab down into this virtual hole in Second Life uh, with the head mount display on and big expensive trackers and so on. Um, this actually, to me, captures what, what we really wanted to do when we started this, this work, which is, this is an avatar in Second Life standing in my lab, right? I'm wearing a head mount display, or would be, in this case, it's a video camera, walking around, looking at this, this live avatar just standing there in the middle of the lab, and it can be controlled remotely. And it's this vision of, can I take that hunk of Second Life, say, into this world room, right? If, could we have remote people attending this, this talk uh, by coming to a, an area like this in Second Life, but could we see them as well? So it's not just them watching us, but can I look out and see avatars sitting and standing around this world? Um, we actually originally created this client to uh, do machinima. We wanted to do this sort of push this notion of mixed physical virtual machinima. It could actually create movies where there's virtual avatars interacting with real people uh, as opposed to sort of the pure virtual machinima. And that's what these effects are trying to, to experiment with. And um, Mark Ackertel has obviously been uh, involved, uh, involved in this as well. Right. Do, you can, uh, do you have that other, the other video? Yeah, uh, one of the things we've done with the university program and with Blair is we've worked on some, some demos. And one of the demos that we've been showing at uh, <coughs> trade shows like CTIA is uh, a mixed reality where we had uh, Georgia Tech students at Georgia Tech within Second Life. So we have the Second Life avatars. Then in the real world, we had a table, and you, for this type of augmented reality that we're doing, you have to lay down a marker. It's a large sheet of white sheet of paper with the squares on it. These squares allow the program to understand where things are. So you know, what we're seeing you know, here is kind of a mock-up of this, of this demo. Uh, you lay down the white sheet with the markers, and you can put a coffee cup and a book. And the scenario that we're seeing is somebody wants to have an ad hoc conference. So they take a book, which would be then the conference table within Second Life, some Lego blocks, and what we can see is, you know, you're looking through your phone at a regular book and the Legos on top of this white sheet of marker, which is a marker. So you're basically, you take your cell phone, you're looking through it as if you're taking a video. And you can see the book and the Legos, but you can also see the people in Second Life walking around the Legos and interacting with them. So by looking through your phone, we're putting the graphic of Second Life on top of the real world of this table. So for example, I have my water bottle, my pen. Now when I'm looking through my phone, I can see the Second Life avatars walking around the bottle, hopping on the bottle, sitting on it. In Second Life, what they're seeing is an outline of a bottle on their island, or just seeing an outline of a bottle an outline of a pen, not the, the details. So they know that it's there, and they can interact with it. So what we're showing is, you know, why are we interested in this? Um, by mixing these realities, this is one area where business is going to want to want to go. You know, if we want to have conferences, if we want to um, interact with people, or even such things, you know, which we'll probably get into, is like if you're looking at a skyscraper that's being built, and you take out your cell phone and you can look at the skyscraper and see the outline of the completed blueprint overlaid on what's being built right now. So we're taking a graphic and overlaying it on the real world. That is something that I believe, from, you know, from our standpoint, that the users are going to want. And that's what's going to come down the pipe and that's why we're interested. Okay. So that's a nice example of what augmented reality can be used for. Uh, does anyone else have any opinions on what it's good for in the short term, what it might be better for in the longer term? Gaming, first and foremost. I mean, from the audience, how many people have an Xbox or a PlayStation or a Wii in your house? You know, look at that. Um, it's already gone retail, and that will really help the whole sphere of augmented reality progress so that it's not weird. Because, yeah, we, we could walk around with goggles and all this stuff, all big phones and everything, and you can have like a Nokia 95 plugged into goggles and look like a complete geek walking down the street. But when we talk about things like the iPad and Eye of Judgment and uh, for any of you with kids who play Viva Pinata, the second one is coming out. The input devices now are changing. We're, we're being trained right now to touch screens 
we're using remotes, we're tilting devices, and now we're being able to interact with cameras, uh, not just in a virtual world, but I kind of like my Grand Theft Auto buddy list sitting on my table. I can look over and just be a spectator to what my friends are doing. I'm not in the mood to play right now, but oh, that was good. Did you just see what happened right there? You know, and I'm watching Liberty City, a little recreation of New York City from the Xbox or the PlayStation existing there. And that's probably one of the easiest sells and probably one of my biggest frustrations about virtual worlds in general is that gaming and virtual worlds tend to not look at each other and they have the most to learn from each other. And I think we really need to embrace that retail and that gaming element when it comes to these future technologies, because that's where there's no explanation needed. Nobody needs an explanation on an Xbox. It's like, I have an Xbox, let's go play. Um, okay, just to, but you, you don't necessarily need the head, headset. Like what we're working on now is using a mobile device, sure. such as your phone, sure. that I could look at the audience and perhaps if, if it was set up right, tag the audience's names. I can see, you know, the audience's names over there. Or having all of the social networking information. I mean, I see a lot of people I know, I know what data I should see when I hold my phone up to John, and I've got his information either on my phone, or yeah, if we had a very unobtrusive type of wearable display, I know how to get in touch with you on Twitter or Facebook or everything else. Um, I, I would like to suggest that it is uh, uh, possible and actually useful to distinguish uh, the, the data collection aspect from the data visualization aspect. So, uh, whether you have, uh, uh, for example, data for our audience laid out on a web page or uh, much more emotionally uh, overlaid by a headset display, it of course matters. But still having the data for the first hand is what, what is most important because without the data we cannot do either. Um, and, and this brings me to my point which is um, the, the semantic nature of uh, AR. Uh, without the semantics, without our uh, capability of tagging properly uh, knowledge, uh, we, we cannot uh, then go to the next step and visualize. And in uh, virtual worlds, of course, this is easy because uh, synthetic realities are semantic by nature. Um, and also we have uh, certain large sets and larger and larger sets where for taxonomic behavior, people voluntarily adding text to stuff helps. Unfortunately, a much, much vaster uh, set of uh, data is, in my opinion, needed uh, where we can't rely on people to use up their uh, lives uh, and keep tagging. Um, so that is where um, sensor networks come into play and that is where it becomes necessary if we want to be able and, uh, and uh, turn our work in a, in, into a semantic understanding that we have to be able to make these systems as autonomous as possible in collecting them. Yeah, I just I want to follow up on that. I think the biggest challenge with augmented reality with getting it working is actually going to be uh, uh, getting information from the real world. The sensor net stuff is going to be really important. Um, the advantage of building augmented reality over virtual reality is you don't need to model everything. So as I look at here, I don't need to build models of all of you if I want to have an avatar standing up there. On the other hand, if I want an avatar to walk down this aisle from my viewpoint, I actually need to know very precisely all of the information about everybody that's sitting there, or the avatar won't appear to go behind you, right? Whether I'm looking at a phone or a magic mirror or something else. And this tension between needing world knowledge in one form, but, but not necessarily needing it in another form, uh, is, is sort of pervades. And it's one of the things that prevents AR from actually sort of getting out there. In addition to this world knowledge, <coughs> You just need to be able to track the phone. How do I? How does my phone know that it's looking at you right now? Right? How does it know it's looking out there? Um, one of the reasons why all these demos use those little black markers is because they're really easy. It's really easy to write computer vision programs to find them and and tell where the phone is in 3D relative to them. Lots of work going on right now by various companies, uh, people in universities, and so on, trying to do things like natural feature tracking or other kinds of tracking to be able to tell where stuff is without covering the world in little black markers. Total version of our friends has uh, a demo kit that you actually had a picture of a car and a picture of a, a teddy bear. And when you held that up to the camera, it played a video of the car on top of the Yeah, there's, there's so lots of... Getting better. There's lots of stuff going on. There's some companies like uh, Total Immersion and others who, who can do stuff on, 
on real powerful computers. Uh, people are starting to work on uh, doing similar things on the handhelds, which I think will will sort of be that necessary next step. Okay. So I uh, asked a few friends um, in preparation for coming here and having to ask intelligent questions. Uh, I sort of crowdsourced it a little bit and asked a few friends, uh, what questions should I ask? And one of them that actually came up a couple of times was um, along the lines of, you know, I'm going I'm to summarize it, but along the lines of the technology that we tend to use to interface with this stuff. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've given examples already on the panel of, of the markers and uh, mobile phones and goggles and headsets and, you know, all that sort of display and capture technology, both sides of it really, uh, has a certain amount of um, what one person described as social isolation. Uh, and as an example, I've actually got a, a couple of pictures of some, some projects, you know, as they look often at the moment, you know, to make this stuff wearable at the moment, um, you know, you, you're often walking around. Uh, and it makes it much harder to interface with the real world when what you're doing is overlaying into each other. Because, you know, you've, you've kind of covered yourself in all this technological clobber. So my question for the panel is, is which technologies at the moment do you think are showing the most uh, the most potential when it comes to overcoming some of this social isolation kind of stuff? We're kind of being, again, it's, uh, we're being trained, we're evolving. How many times, how many people have iPhones or have seen about a thousand people walking through the halls like this <laughs> down the street? We, we're looking at devices more and more. We're, we're taking pictures and capturing the world like this more and more. That was. How, how many years are we into this? And it's, I mean, it's really not a lot, but now it's just not even weird to stand on the street corner and hold up a box in front of your head and walk down the street <laughs> looking at a box. So are we isolated? Are we, I mean, some would say yes. This is kind of ridiculous that everyone's walking around looking at their phones. And they're getting bigger and there's more stuff to do. I don't even really need to pay attention. I can just play a game while I'm walking down the street or driving as bad of a reality that, as that is. California, we can't, talk on the phone when we drive. You can hold a bottle of water to your phone when you drive, when you, to your, when you drive, but you can't hold a phone. So now our, our phones are dropping below the dashboard. It doesn't make it right, <laughs> but it does kind of make it a reality. So now our distance, you know, you do it, you know you do it. It doesn't make it right. <laughs> but we are already isolating ourselves, and we're kind of, I think, in denial about it. That's just the extreme case. I mean, who knows, maybe in five years that will be cool. You know, what will look good in Macy's. <laughs> so, so uh, Justin TV looks better than that. I was going to say, I, yeah, there's yeah. lots of pictures of me on the internet wearing stuff like this. Um, <laughs> uh, as a graduate student. Um, so the, yeah, you don't have to go look. Um, so the, the, the thing I, I've been, uh, I like to say, say these days, how many people remember when Bluetooth headsets first appeared? You know, how many people thought they were the geekiest, most ungodly things they'd ever seen and swore they would never wear them? Right? How many of you now have one? Right. Um, I don't. Um, how many of you, to add to that, but, how many of you live in California or Washington where you have to have one? Yeah. It's the law now. To, or hands-free or speaker -free. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, the, the thing with the head-mounted display, that will clearly never never be popular except maybe, I don't know, I don't know where it will be popular, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pitching kids of the next generation, but when it's a, a nice pair of glasses, when it's, you know, uh, everything's embedded, there's no cords hanging off, there's, there's no whatever, and there's an application that matters, right? So your, your question about isolation is really interesting. One of, we recently studied one of our handheld AR games, and we actually, it was a collaborative fishing game, don't ask, but uh, uh, on a table. So you're, you're using a, a, a little handheld game device, and there's three or four people sitting around sort of at this shared space. We actually found that people behaved and felt more like the game was on the table instead of on the headset, and, and the handheld started to feel more like a window into this virtual world, as opposed to studies that have looked at people playing shared games on, say, Nintendo DS's, where they find that, found that people, if we were playing a game together on a DS, we would be sort of completely isolated from each other, even though we're sitting beside each other, because we're totally focused on this little screen. Or people who play sort of online, online games, and they're not really playing together, they're playing <coughs> alone in a group of people. Um, and, and, and when you start feeling like the stuff is out there in the world, and behaving like the stuff is out there in the world, it actually breaks, starts to break through this isolation, I think, where you know, I start, can say things like that over there and point at the table where I don't see anything and we all understand what that is, as opposed to this thing here to your left down 
whatever. So I think um, that's what that's what interests me about AR is that fact that we can start to, to get around this isolation. Um, in the spirit of uh, the book, uh, everything that is good for you. I don't know uh, how many people have read it or heard of it. Um, I, I would like to contend that actually uh, it, it is not true, uh, or not necessarily true, that, uh, that we are isolating because of these devices. These devices actually are connecting us, uh, each other better than we could before, just like social networks are letting us discover old lost friends and keep in touch with them, people are following each other on, on these, and, and, and the intensity uh, of sharing actually is so... Um, so high on those uh, networks for some of us that it feels like you are there. You know, when people are commenting on the Flickr stream of my vacation photos, uh, they actually say, as if I were with you day by day, day after day, because I am uploading them daily. Um, and uh, another little uh, remark, uh, when mobile phones were emerging uh, 10 years ago, we were all uh, freaking out because somebody would use them in a restaurant uh, or that they would start ringing in a theater. And uh, sometimes this can be still a problem and actually currently people are freaking out because they are about to be introduced in flights too. Uh, but uh, little by little, uh, as, as a society, we actually learned what made sense and what didn't make sense. And, and we didn't need uh, uh, any laws for it. We didn't need uh, uh, it, it emerged as a consensus. So, uh, absolutely, it will definitely be normal uh, to hold something up. For example, when you will be in a store, uh, and there will be no store chain that will allow themselves to kick somebody out of the store because they are comparison shopping right there. And, and a few months ago, it happened. And it ended up uh, on, on the blogs, and of course, the store chain backpedaled. It was a little bit too late from a PR point of view, but in the future it will be unadmissible not to allow somebody to take full advantage of what AR will uh, let them do. Um, now, uh, recently I've done, I've completed some focus groups, and you know the picture we see of people with headsets—that's one way of looking at augmented reality. Uh, another way of looking at it is we did some focus groups of uh, movie posters, for example, and in the corner of the movie poster was a, a square, we used a, a barcode at this point. But when you look through your mobile device at the poster and at that little square, uh, it instantaneously launched the, um, the trailer for the movie. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the poster and through your device or your cell phone, you see the trailer of the movie. So we're, we're pushing the graphic on top of the real world of the poster. Then you can click your phone and then the movie trailer would then pop up on your cell phone. Okay, so that's augmented reality without the headsets. Uh, the same type of ideas, uh, which were very popular, were uh, back of the DVD. Instead of renting or buying a DVD, you turn over the DVD, take out your, your cell phone, you look at the little symbol, and you can start seeing the trailer of the DVD going. So instead of wearing the headsets and this, there's other forms of augmented reality where we can lay the graphics on, very unobtrusive. But then from a business standpoint, why would we want to do this? Uh, what we've been finding is, that it allows the end users to get the information when they want it. So if you're gonna buy a DVD, wouldn't it be great to see the trailer right then? It's something, you're, you're pulling the information instead of having it pushed at you. Um, and you're reading a magazine, you see a nice article, or an advertisement, or it could be an article, you want more information, you pull out your cell phone, it starts running automatically, you click on it, and now you can see more information about something that you want to see. So this technology can allow you also to pull up URLs. So similar to uh, QR codes, but instead of uh, you know, just seeing the, the dead square of a QR code, it launches something a little bit more active, a little bit more eye-catching. So that, that's a, a great thing you brought up there, and it was something I wanted to ask anyway, was um, we've heard a lot in this conference about interoperability. And given the nature of the conference, people are interested in interoperability, interoperability between different virtual worlds. Um, you just give an example there of, of potential interoperability between augmented reality and other bits of the web. And I guess there's also, you know, we've, we've been talking about safety issues and, uh, you know, social issues of how you interact with this stuff. There's also the interoperability and the way that that has to be handled between augmented reality and, and the real world. Um, so those three 
things coming together and, and potentially more as you overlay different dimensions on this. Are there, um, you know, is there an obvious roadmap here? Is this something that, that people researching this are sort of thinking about and working on at the moment in terms of how do and should you bring those things together? Is it purely ad hoc or are there, you know, are there standards that are emerging? What, what's, the, what's the space like at the moment? Is it as messy as it is for the rest of us in virtual worlds? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think some stuff will appear sooner than others. Um, there's already things with the QR codes and so on. Uh, a company I work with uh, called Media Power is, is trying to, to, is developing a handheld uh, a player that's going to sort of be able to do sort of some more uh, markerless logo, logo recognition for the kind of applications that Mark just mentioned. Um, and that stuff's going to start appearing in the next year or so. But then when we, when we want to do more sophisticated things, you know, we want to get all this information around us, there'll be questions of how do you decide what to show, how do you uh, deal with the safety issues and so on. I mean, I think we're, we're going to have to develop standards that are akin to HTTP and, and uh, HTML and, and so forth. Probably be some sort of, you know, AR, ML, I've seen people propose sorts of things like that, that combine geotagging with semantics uh, and so forth uh, to get out there. We're going to have to develop standards for how you actually express world knowledge in general. If, if there are sensor nets in here that are collecting information about the number of people in the room and the generic general layout, maybe from ca cameras on the ceiling of, of who's here, how do we make that available in sort of a way that my little AR application on my phone can get at? Um, and I think it'll be a sort of a combination of uh, commercial services, the equivalent of things like Frommer's restaurant guide for, you know, location information. It'll be a, a, a competitive advantage kind of thing. You can imagine the Staples Center that itself may make lots of information about the space available to the mobile, mobile apps. Um, and I think that will evolve over time. Um, my big worry is, is that things get buried inside of standalone custom applications. I mean, I like Google Earth. Right? But there's a lot of stuff we can't do with Google Earth, and in particular, I can't get the data out of their viewer. Right? And so if everybody decides to put all of their world models and all of their, their geotagged information in KML or whatever linked into Google Earth, that really limits how we, can, how we can use it. So I think having as many standards that link in to those things and uh, are available outside of those platforms will be, will be key. I just fear we're going to be making the same mistakes over and over and over again. It doesn't matter if it's a virtual world, a social network, a browser, a console, standards. I mean, protocols, yes, absolutely. But yeah, we're in, you know, everybody wants to build their own little walled garden. Why do I? I mean, outside of the, yeah, absolutely. We just need to It doesn't matter if it's Facebook, MySpace, Disney Online. I mean, it's all going to be everybody's going to want to do it their way with their value add. And the, the commercialism actually can screw it up. But we, we will not learn. We will continue on the same path of having every silo, you know, it's, it's a dismal step. Uh, actually, uh, it is a natural uh, sequence, a natural cycle, because uh, first, uh, once commercialization kicks in, uh, after the academics study the field for a few years or a few decades, it is natural for each company to shoot for the moon and try and grab it all. Uh, and that is what brings fragmentation of different competing standards or, or proposed uh, uh, like such. Uh, if, on the other hand, the academics decided to standardize something too early, uh, they could very well be wrong. Uh, some of you might remember X400, uh, which was the proposed email standard, which was so cumbersome and so convoluted and luckily didn't take off. Uh, but uh, going back to Ruth's uh, question about uh, interoperability, in my view, uh, that comes very naturally once again from the issue of data flow uh, because it is kind of a Ptolemaic mistake to um, give uh, a real reality uh, uh, on a pedestal as if it had a special role it obviously has but uh, in, as he said data can flow from virtual worlds to the reality or backwards or across virtual worlds and it should uh, but we can only achieve this if uh, it is interoperable. Now, my worry is that we are only concentrating on the interoperability issues that concern 
uh, avatar transfer representation or object transfer, as we have heard on some of the other uh, panels and inventory. But a complication is that uh, as we build communities and societies that must find a, a correct representation across uh, different uh, worlds and realities, we must take into consideration culture, rights, and laws. Uh, because uh, rules of behavior uh, can vary so much uh, that uh, if there is a concrete value uh, that is held in, in one world and you just take it and bring it to someplace else where that value is totally wasted. Um, my favorite example is that when you traverse words and your avatar can um, become slightly autonomous and finds a world where slavery is legal, you know? Uh, it, it can be very messy. And so, just like Creative Commons was extremely good in uh, realizing that uh, contracts could be automated, on one hand, by XML, still retaining the legal structure that was proper, and easy to understand for people, we have to strive and be as uh, creative and inventive as, as they have been to solve and face these face these issues and hopefully solve them uh, as, as we make our worlds uh, interoperable with reality. Thank you. Um, one last question from me before I turn it open to questions from the floor. Uh, who here on the panel has read Halting State by Charles Stross? In the middle. In the middle, halfway through, that's the best bit. Yeah. Anyone here? Sorry, sorry. spoil. A few people. Okay. Uh, and, and what about Post Singular from uh, 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 Rudy Rooker? Um, it's fantastic. Um, well, I haven't read that one. I, I have read Hunting State, and now I want to. I, you have to put that in your life book. So, like, yeah. the, the first book I heard somebody ask about the first book. Uh, it was Halting State. Yeah. By yeah. So Charles Halting Charles. State um, by Halting State. It's amazing how we have to document everything in our lives instantly, so that everyone outside of here can see it as well as us. Halting State by Charlie Strauss. Um, and it's... Ah, I broke it. Um, I'm trying to do two things at once. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry? And the other one that was mentioned, David, will be typing as we speak, so you'll see it on the screen. Um, but for the benefit of the recording, I'll read it when I see it. Um, so Halting State is this, this novel, it's a science fiction by Charlie Strauss about the... Um, the inevitability of, of augmented reality uh, in even the way that the police work and you know just completely part of, of life and, and the world. Uh, and if you're interested in this subject, uh, a lot of people are comparing it to um, sort of this generation's uh, snow crash. You know, this is the, the next wave, this is the, the, the sci-fi book that sets the agenda for the next 20 years. Um, and I endorse it and recommend it to you, a really, really good read. Um, so, as a sort of question veiled as a suggestion, that's my, my uh, <laughs> contribution to the panel. Anyone on the floor uh, want to ask a question, uh, please do and I'll repeat it for you. And, uh, and there were a couple of questions that came in to oh, me good. via Twitter from that's the audience, but I think somebody had kind of addressed these. Um, one is about um, how do we get an API for the real world, and that came from Ian. And another question was about the metatagging question you asked about um, the, the metadata and the, the tagging. I think there's the same questions, and I think uh, you also briefly uh, addressed the issue of the tagging. Uh, how do we tag data, real life? Or is that just a spillover from what we're already doing online with photos and, and such? Yeah, well, um, I am to, to answer partially your, your question. Uh, we uh, provide a software layer for uh, pulling, aggregating, uh, recording, managing, um, encrypted, uh, authenticated, reliable data flows. Uh, of course, um, the objects that we can uh, manage have to be IP addressable and, and have to be uh, also, they have to have a sensor. Uh, when, when your car navigator um, uh, designs a route for you and it doesn't know that a ditch has been dug across your road in the night, it will just happily uh, let you drive it. <laughs> um, we call that the spine class zero. 
because it is in no connection at all with reality. It just connects with the satellites. Uh, so when you have a sensor, that is what we call spine category one. And Bruce Sterling, the, the, the third science fiction author to be quoted uh, today, is of course the, the uh, inventor of this uh, expression. So we, we must be spinifying the world in order for us to be a <coughs> reality. That is uh, an, essential, an essential precondition. So, in, in the spirit of science fiction, I'll plug my favorite AR book, which is uh, Rainbow's End by Bernard Vinge yeah. um, uh, on AR. Uh, so, I will, the, the notion of how do we tag things and, and, and semantics is actually the sort of root of my interest in combining virtual worlds with, with augmented reality. Uh, you mentioned the notion of there's lots of photos, right? And, and there may be people out here who are using sort of the uh, Twitterific on the iPhone or one of the other Twitter Twitter apps that, that lets you geotag your tweets, right? And but the question is, if you are typing something and it's geotagged in this room, assuming GPS worked in here, um, do you do you care about the specific location? If your GPS signal is within a meter of where you're sitting right here, is is the information? If I came back in and wanted to see it, should it be there? Should it be in this room? Should it be on the wall? You know, if I was going to create an AR application that got all the geotag photos from this room, would I want to sort of display them where people took them from, or would I want to plaster them on the walls? Right? When I want to plaster them on the walls, I need to know where the walls are. And I need to know sort of those white areas up there, or cream areas up there, are actually a really good place to post photos. Right? So I have this sort of mental image of this sort of semantically tagged virtual world that reflects our physical world that allows people to author content such that it, it gets placed in reasonable locations and can interact with the AR system in reasonable ways. You know, you may want to say, my application should lay out my, my photos in the open space. Right? And that open space is defined by the people who build the models in the Staples Center or uh, whoever built some KML model of, of, of buildings as I walk down Figueroa Street. And if we're ever going to get to real applications, we need to not only just be able to, to tag things with geocodes, we need to sort of start having this semantic model of the world that really lets us say meaningful things, aggregate sensor data, aggregate sort of our friends, where they are and all this. And I think it's, it's going to be a long time till we get there. But it needs to sort of be a generic standard that isn't tied to a specific platform. You know, I, I do a lot of work in Second Life, and I like to think of Second Life as that that set of uh, uh, the equivalent to the eventual 3D web as all of those hypertext systems were before the web, right? Those centralized things that someone controlled that was on someone's server, and that very few people used because of that. Um, similarly. When we can have this data spread around, we'll look back at Second Life and go, that was cool because it was the first big, real thing that let us create user-generated content. But until we get there, uh, we're not going to get a lot of the AR apps that lots of us have imagined. Well, we also have to think about the metadata of experiences. I mean, this is a virtual worlds conference. How many people in here met somebody virtually, whether it was Twitter or SL or otherwise, first? And then you meet in real life, and then maybe you go on to, you know, play a game together on the Xbox, and you're, you're doing, you have, uh, part of my work is based on the fact that it's great that um, a company might own their IP, but they don't own my experiences. So if I met John and SL, which we, we did, and we've met at tons of conferences, and I think we've gamed on some consoles, our locations are in and out of a, it's always fun to bring up space and time, when <laughs> they talk about these things. Now we're starting to talk about places and things that happened, fake or otherwise, across a ton of systems. Now how do we tag that? That's, and then how do we access that in, you know, I'm not even sure how to display that. Yeah, it's like, Bending it's, space yeah, you start time. tagging things by the conference or the, 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 the meal you were having or something, as opposed to just where you were. Right? Yeah. Location is one thing. Cool, so uh, I think we're ready for questions from the floor. And Tish has just perfectly timed this by raising <laughs> her hand on the front row Tish, what's your question? Well, I have a question and it comes from kind of the last statements at the end of your talk. Um, you said that there's no need to tag 
not for profit, but it's a social purpose. And a lot of this technology, as we've understand sort of early on, is seen as a surveillance technology or a push technology for advertising. And so far, manifesting is quite common now to actually use your phone on a magazine and age, whatever you get But I'm hearing from you, Blair, right? These ideas really that are actually more in the realm of Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question. I'm going to summarise it. Uh, so I've been doing it electronically as well. The question uh, was uh, around the, the points of social purpose um, and, um, and around the idea of, of social good, but also uh, what are the implications on social space when we start instrumenting the world with so much powerful surveillance technology, even if its primary purpose is more than just surveillance, even if it's for something, something deeper than that. Um, David, you're into the Internet of Things. Let's start with you. Uh, well, um, for, for us it is extremely important that uh, this is actually uh, properly addressed. Um, the web ran uh, the risk of being uh, pushed back and, and uh, stopped uh, or heavily uh, regulated because uh, privacy issues, cookie management, all those things were not uh, properly thought through in parallel of its development and adoption. So uh, we are uh, working with uh, the EFF uh, to, to try and find uh, what are the best practices and the recommendations for properly managing uh, spam data by uh, individuals, uh, corporations, and uh, government. Um, in, in the meantime, we have uh, acquired also uh, very uh, loud uh, adversaries uh, who called us the slime of spine, uh, uh, which is, I, I think, good, you know. Uh, I, I think it's good to be able and, and face your critics early on. Um, so, um, whether um, surveillance uh, is going to increase, uh, I think, is, is, uh, is, is uh, necessarily true. <coughs> Not only because uh, we're already seeing those tendencies, but uh, because surveillance can be a pretty good thing. Uh, if you have a bridge uh, that strains under the stress of trucks passing over it day after day, and you don't realize that its structural <coughs> integrity is, uh, uh, is failing, well, you want to survey that bridge constantly. So we have to, to understand before it breaks. So we, we have to understand that what, what the possible applications are and, and, and find uh, ways to, to counter totalitarian uses. Um, we, we don't have the answers, of course, for the moment, but uh, we, have, we are trying very, very hard to make sure that we, we are ready with uh, at least recommendations uh, as, as our tools are going to be adopted more widely. Totalitarianism is also user generated now. Every single person in this room has the ability to receive and send audio, video, text, photography, and can broadcast live to a pretty much pinpointed location right now. I mean, I can walk by you with a telephone and all, they all have cameras on the back. I can be broadcasting a live video. I can walk by your computer. I can grab all of the information off your screen just by standing around and just being like, well, this is some loud guy on the phone. So it's not just the them, it's the us. And part of 1984 is among us, it's ourselves. 
and depending on the culture of where you're from, help put us on camera. Ooh, me, 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 I want to get most hits on YouTube. And that helps propagate the fact that there's cameras and broadcasting and performance everywhere. It's very easy to flip it around and use it for evil. We cannot ignore that we are part of that. Uh, would you like uh, uh, Rue to comment on how the, in the UK the government is trying to co-opt uh, uh, citizens uh, in uh, uh, monitoring uh, terrorist activities uh, by tourists snapping photos of public monuments? Uh, Here I too. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't really like to comment, but uh, I think you summed it up. Yeah, I think you summed up the uh, the mood of the world on that. Blah, blah. Yeah, so I, I can't follow those other two comments. Um, I mean, from a the, one of the reasons. So the, the question I think I, I heard was this notion of how do we actually, in some sense, how do we make that happen? Yeah, how do we get, um, how do we get these rules? So yeah, we and I mean, one of the reasons why I really like the idea of having this sort of distributed, heterogeneous set of data so that you know I could put a model of my, my living room on my website and somehow there's an infrastructure that finds all of these models and has an authentication component built in so that you know only Georgia Tech students and staff and faculty can get the interior details of Georgia Tech buildings and Alcatel can have their buildings and information available to their staff and there might be a different set of models for the visitor and the, and the person across the street once we have that and we have that necessarily distributed thing, you don't need to have full details, right? All we need to have is a generic sort of set of three planes, three polygons that define these spaces. I don't need to know all of those lights and panels and so on. And because it's distributed, much like the, the sort of all the modeling that's being done in Google Earth where people contribute different buildings and, and so on, you can start to build this stuff up piecemeal. The other, the other reason I like the distributed nature it sort of gets to the social and legal issues, which is if it's centralized, who gets to put something up in the front of the Staples Center? You know, um, if there's a if there's a base map service, right? There's a basic global service like Google Earth that provides the basic infrastructure. There may be something put out by the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, by the Staples Center itself, by photos or one of the travel guides. And you could include those in your, your set of stuff and they may respect, respect certain kinds of privacy rights and, and property rights. Like access control is what you're yeah. really talking about. But all, of this model, all of these models are public record, aren't Yeah, they? well, okay. they could or they couldn't be, but if, if, if you centralize everything, then we're gonna have those discussions up front. But, you know, in, practical, in a practical nature, nobody can stop any of us taking a picture right now and posting in our blog, right? Um, and if it, and that's because we control our blogs and so on. If we have the same thing for all of these this base data, I can go and put virtual graffiti all around this wall. And if you choose to display my 3D AR screen, then you'll see it. If you don't, you won't, right? And 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 so you sort of get that same nature of the web, which I think is is sort of what has made the web the web, right? Is the fact that anybody can post anything. If you want to read it, you can. If you don't, you don't. And and. Now it sort of comes down to if Google shows it to you, you might see it. If they don't, you won't. Um, which is a whole sort of separate issue. Um, so th there's going to be services like this, and 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 I see that as the way that this stuff will take off, uh, because there's no way we're ever going to have detailed models of the entire world available. I mean, uh, I was looking around at some of the some of the sort of world sites like uh, uh, GeoSim Philly or whatever is one of those examples of a of a complete model of a city, and the amount of data is unbelievable, right? And it has to be complete because it's a virtual world. It's sort of, it's there, it's not. For AR, it doesn't need to be complete. It just needs to be those three polygons in this room that tells us where we can put the photos. <laughs> and they could have been done by you, by me, by one of these, these folks up here, as we needed and felt the sort of desire to, to add them for whatever purpose. And, and so I think that's actually one of the things that will make AR different. Is we don't need all that information. We only need to know where that virtual bulletin board is out front. Okay, so I'm going to take one more question um, from the floor, because I think we've got time just for one more. And there's some, someone in the front. Uh, besides consumers toying with AR applications and tagging their meals or, or pictures, uh, how do you see AR moving into a corporate space, and w w which verticals will be among the early adopters? Okay, so the question was, uh, how will augmented reality be picked up by the uh, commercial rather than just the consumer space, and who will be the early adopters there? Uh, well, tourism, first of all. I mean, you're in front of the Washington Monument, you start taking a picture of the, you know, a video of the Washington Monument, George Washington walks into your phone, 
turns to you and starts explaining it. Uh, other good opportunities is you're at a Best Buy and you see three different TVs, you pull out your, your phone and it automatically takes you to a website where you know, a user uh, comments on the different TVs. Um, you know, the idea that you want to bring in the information that you want when you want it can be almost unlimited. Uh, other, other verticals could be, um, you know, such thing as architecture, you know, construction, construction. Um, you know. Um, I think that the keynote that we heard this morning describing a 3D uh, data control center can be uh, immediately uh, viewed as an AR uh, application when you take into account the connection uh, with, with the sensors that uh, inform the model and actually change the shape of the, uh, the rack uh, as it overheats or something. So uh, IBM with SAP uh, and, and uh, Implania, uh, a Swiss construction uh, company, created a, a joint venture called Yolus uh, exactly to explore these applications. And they are also uh, experimenting with sensor networks in a broader sense. Military so, education are probably two of the really obvious ones too, although not corporate. So I, I think, um, Collaboration uh, and, and uh, telework, those sorts of things. We, when we created our, our Second Life stuff, we got a lot of interest from some of the various companies that have created islands in Second Life to try to explore how to do collaboration. Um, we're actually starting a project with Sun, trying to use Wonderland uh, uh, to add augmented mixed reality features to it to try to um, make the distributed collaboration more effective. Right? There's Everybody who's done an audio conference or a video conference knows how the remote people, if there's an imbalance, are always second-class citizens. And so I have this hope, or optimism, I'm an academic, I'm inherently optimistic, that, uh, that by using mixed reality techniques, not necessarily head mounts, I like head mounts, but um, nobody I work with does, uh, to try to bring people more into that space together. And I, so I think there is a possibility of using AR for making distributed collaboration more effective, which, which could be a, a big deal if it works, right? Because virtual worlds are still too hard to use. Video conferencing is still not quite what you'd like. And if we can figure out how to sort of get the people around us, like they would be, be around us, and have it feel more like you're together and start taking advantage of all of our social and, and physical abilities, that, I think, could be a big, big deal. Um, okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, we're at the end of the hour, so I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking my uh, wonderful panel for I think a really good insight. Thanks to David for that as well. So you can go to David's blog to find out uh, everything you missed. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I also recorded a video and it will be up on Google Video for anybody who is interested. Yeah.